Welcome to another New Empress video blog. We're here with Peter Sazday, director of The Stone Tape, first broadcast in 1972 on the BBC. Peter, thanks for joining us. Um, can you give us a brief outline of The Stone Tape? Oh, no. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Do you think I remember 41 years back at my age? You must be joking. Uh, well, it will be seen at BFI uh, in December. And if you're interested, I'm sure you can come along. I know I will be here on the 14th and doing a QA and a as well. What happened on Christmas Day 1972, um, that was a ghost story, and it was well publicized at the time, because the idea was that it's not just an ordinary ghost story with dressed up in nice long costumes and funny bonnets, and they go along and they said, wah, it's a ghost. Uh, but the idea was that we are now electronic, new age, we're going to do it differently. So wonderful Nigel Neal, Quatermass fame, uh, was commissioned by the BBC to write a ghost story, but what you expect from Nigel Neal, Quatermass, is not going to be what I just described, but use something to do with technology, full of surprises. And he came up with a storyline um, on that commission, and I came on through the head of plays at the time was Christopher Morahan, who was an old acquaintance, friend, colleague, because we both started exactly the same time uh, at ATV doing emergency ward 10 <laughs> in a small room called room 19, <laughs> where there were three directors and <laughs> we were doing live television together. <laughs> I did 38 episodes. I'm sure Chris done more because he was there when I arrived. That's my very first drama in this country from the accent, knowing it's from Hungarian, you know, right? Uh, Dracula land. <laughs> That's why I ended up with Hammer <laughs> doing Draculas also. But going back to the stone tape, uh, Chris thought, having by then done uh, about three Hammer pictures and also some sci-fi for the BBC, like Isaac Asimov, Caves of Steel, and others, that probably it would be a good chemistry, cross fingers, Nigel Neal with his background, Peter says they with his background, so we wrote together, and once the first draft was in, my job was to work together and develop it further. So I used to go to Barnes, where he lived. By the way, we call Nigel Neal as Tom. Don't ask me why, but his name is Tom, but his credits is Nigel Neal, so for, I'm forcing myself to say Nigel, <laughs> but I've known him all his life as Tom. If you <laughs> accidentally say Tom, we know who but you're so talking about That's now. why I'm making quite clear, <laughs> but I know in previous interviews and uh, other public appearances that it's Nigel Neal, but at home, his dear wife, and everybody called him Tom. Um, so we, I used to go back to him, because he was a bit older, so it's polite, and we worked uh, in his kitchen and changed. The wonderful thing with Nigel Neal, and it's the same with Quatermass, that his mind is racing away with ideas, and it takes time to try to work out what is he really talking about. Because it's so brilliant, but it's so undisciplined, so it's very difficult to think, that, oh, how am I going to make him to write it on the page? And then even more difficult, how am I going to put it on the screen? <laughs> so most of the probably six weeks exercise, um, going back, and I think it's approximately six weeks, was to discipline him and try to get the storyline into a framework which can be translated into a 90 minutes film. Film is not the word what we use film today, but film what we call a television play. P-L-A-Y play, like a stage play. Right. Because in fact, we at the time were using the technique of a live play. My job was we using several cameras, but never exceeding more than four at the time, cut large chunks of the play live while we were doing it. So the actors, who I rehearsed with before, but very limited rehearsals, because we were going to actual locations in East Horsley, in, you know, sorry, and it's an old house, used to be SX Electricity Board. 
uh, used to own that place. And we just found it, they moved out, so I thought before anybody else we move in. <laughs> uh, just like Ryan Electrics moved in, um, the company's story we are telling. But we rehearsed and then we recorded big, big chunks approximately 20 minutes at the time, which then later on we tried to make it shorter. But my job was, and the cameraman, that we do continuous action. So they move fast, live, from position to position, which meant that the director, and I'm not unique to it, it's just one of the many drama directors of that age, uh, we had to work to a camera script Nowadays, when I talk to younger directors, or when I used to do um, some little sort of workshops working with younger directors, which I thoroughly enjoy, by the way, doing it, because it's great fun to see their enthusiasm, wanting to find out. But then they dismiss it immediately <laughs> because they say, oh, but, oh, but that's no good because then I can't improvise. Right. And I can't feel free. I don't feel free. Well, free is good in one way. I never regret the experience when people like Morahan and myself, we worked hard to do things live. But you cannot improvise. Because yeah. when you did Emergency War 10, when you had 17 million viewing figures, every Tuesday, Friday, live, 7.30 to 8 p.m., you couldn't improvise a hell of a lot because they were watching it at the time. Right. Uh, but it's another story. So when we were doing it, I need to do a camera script. So I had to produce a camera script before I go to the studio or a set. So at home, sitting at my little desk or at the kitchen with pencil and rubbers and little sort of like playing sort of football with <laughs> <laughs> buttons, I had the characters. I worked out, this is camera one, that's camera two, that's camera three, that's camera four. So if they are there and the actors are moving from that computer to that desk and that's the door, I will be having a two shot from there, a three shot from there, then I get one more high up so you can look down on all of them. Then I worked out the shots. So when he says, where are you going, Jill? Then it's a cut to camera three. <laughs> then he says, blah, 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 blah. Then we cut to camera one. This is a close up now of Brock. Then back to three, now it's a two shot, and so on and so on. So when I produce that handwritten camera script, then my PA will time this one out. And then from there, she will type the camera cards where each cameraman will have his shots. So the camera one operator will only have his shots, like 109, 113, 121. So he will have his cards, he flips over. So when on his ears, he hears from gallery, he says, coming to 101, he knows that his, and then his next one will be 113. Right, okay. It's all happening live, and it's all happened at home when I was writing on the <laughs> pencil my shots, then hopefully, after years of experience, she, my P, I use wonderful girls at the time, they learned to read my writing, so they, into the night, they were typing, and then they were typing out the cards, type that one out, that goes to the studio, and we do the camera rehearsal where poor sort of actors stop, start, stop, start, because the camera boys and the boom operator, who doesn't want to go in too soon for a close-up to get a closer sound, he has to be up quickly for before we cut to the longer shot, because otherwise his boom will be in. And several times he was in. How long was it taking you to do all of this drawing and penciling when uh, you were at home? How, how long did it take you to do well, 20 minutes? It, 20 minutes worth of sequence, yeah, roughly. Yeah. So we're talking about roughly 25 pages. I worked out I can do approximately five pages an hour. Right. Give you an idea. Yeah. Having had a conception in my mind, then once I had the conception, then really I had to get jolly good floor plans from the designer where really I, they know how I like my floor plan, so it very clearly shows uh, where I would don't want to cross the line. Cross the line meaning that I mustn't get a camera here 
I'm going to cut to that. She's in the wrong side of that imaginary line, which looks like Charlie is going to kiss Sue, who is there, but <laughs> leaning that way. So it looks very funny, because if you're crossing the line, so you have to be careful. You, you don't do silly things like that. Uh, but the more experience you get, you more you really learn it and you do it faster. The secret is that you don't think of ideas for movements which will be unnatural for an actor. And you cross fingers and everything else that your ideas will be accepted by the actors. At the same time, you must be flexible that at the camera rehearsal, if it doesn't come natural, you'll be the first one to say to change it. Yeah. You don't ever be rigid. And the camera script cannot go to the stage of Peter at home writing until the dry rehearsal. The dry rehearsal meaning above the pub in a room which over the weekend was a wedding, so we still have a bit of the decoration <laughs> left over. We come in <laughs> and we're playing very seriously Nigel Neal, but we're still seeing sort of the You've funny, got the bride and groom in yeah, the background. the background <laughs> still almost there. So we do the dry rehearsal. I cannot start doing camera script prep until I have actually done what I call the emotional rehearsal. Right. I, I analyze the text, I analyze the characters and their relationships. Once this has gone through that process of dry rehearsal, i.e. there's nothing technical at that stage, it's really just myself and the actors. And that's it, it's a close. I usually, that's my really favorite time. Right. Because there is nothing technical and I never allow anybody else coming in. Because I want the actors to feel totally relaxed. Yeah. Uh, let themselves go, make a fool of themselves. Uh, because it's a small family. Yeah. And it's just us. You're talking about the actors. You've got some well-known faces in there. You've got Michael Bryant, Ian Cuthbertson, Michael Bates, Reginald Marsh, James Cosmo and Jane Asher. Right. Were you surprised at the amount of talent? No. No? Not at all. <laughs> Not, at all. <laughs> Not at all. Because my then, uh, don't forget, if, if you did your homework and you see some of the credits before 1972, um, sort of artist I have had the pleasure and privilege to work with, uh, there was a kind of rap quality behind me. So if you think about that, by then I done BBC terms classics, Wuthering Heights, uh, another Bronte, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, uh, Henry James, The Spoils of Poynton, some very well-known artists. I also, by then, on my films, um, Eric Porter, who was strong for Foresight Saga, I brought in for a Hammer film. Yeah. Hammer said, you can't send the script to Eric Porter. He just did Foresight Saga. He <laughs> won't do Hammer. I said, well, he's only two words uh, to choose from, yes or no. So, I mean, that's very simple. So, I, my philosophy always been for casting, always start on the top. Right. And then you go down the list. Because, yes or no. Yeah. And the more you establish your relationship with better known, high quality actors, they feel when next they get a script from me, but if he and she work with him, maybe there is something in it. Why don't I try it? Yeah. So Michael Bryant, I never heard before, but because I sent him a script, so many other national theater actors, Michael Bryant never left the national theater from day one. He was one of the longest serving actors. If you ever look back on the national theater, which now in his 50th years of anniversary, it's very interesting. Um, that was one of the receptions and the, that they have a sort of list of who joined when. Michael Bryan joined at the day one, and he died as a National Theatre player. He never left the National Theatre. Yeah. He became an associate artist of it, like on the board, if you would say it, in the Council of National Theatre, with people like Peggy Ashcroft names. And Michael was an anti-player. And I had the pleasure to work with a lot of anti-players by then, 
So I said, I can just see him. And in fact, Tom, Nigel Neal, very much felt, oh gosh, we've just seen him there. He's got this nervous energy <laughs> in that. Because that's what Brian is, nervous energy. Yeah. And uh, first choice, yes. Jane Asher is a different story. Because Jane Asher, that was by then, the third time <laughs> I worked with her. Because first I met her when she was a tour hero, little child actress. Um, Mommy brought her for rehearsal, read through in an emergency ward then. <laughs> uh, second time I worked in a new dreadful ATV hospital series, I want to forget it. But there again, by then, she was a teenager. And the interesting there to show us how little I had interest outside my drama, that in the bond, Coffee break, I must say, because I haven't said this story for years to anyone. There was a coffee break in that rehearsal, and there was a lovely actor called Marius Goring. You might, might not know him. He was in Red Shoes, the male star of a wonderful film. I think probably you know Red Shoes. Um, and it was a coffee break, and Marius Goring was looking at a little sort of gold piece hanging from necklace, or a little heart shape. And he looked at, oh, and I mean, nosy with my coffee. I go there, what are you looking at? And little Jane Asher, the teenager, said, it's my boyfriend. <laughs> I look at it, he said, who is he? He said, it's Paul McCartney. And I said, who is he? <laughs> he was one of the Beatles. I had no idea at the time. That's when Jane was Paul McCartney's girlfriend for a limited period. And I was the idiot who didn't know who Paul <laughs> McCartney is at the time. And the third time I worked with Jane, it was <laughs> the stone tape. But each time, we had, she reminds me, you know. The Paul McCartney oh, story. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then about a few months ago, it was a big charity do we went, and she sat at the next table with her husband, and she came over. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a few months ago. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's a long-running story with Jane about. <laughs> You'll never forget McCartney now. I <laughs> know. I know. It's just only what that shows sort of tunnel vision at the time <laughs> as a young drama director coming from abroad meant nothing to me. <laughs> she was so sweet. It's my boyfriend. <laughs> um, you're talking about Nigel Neal, Tom. Yeah. What was his take on the adaptation? What, did you hear back from him once it had screened? What what did he say once it aired? Well, the absolute true story, he's not a social animal. He's not <laughs> that easy. Took me a long, not just me, the BBC, uh, to get him like a sort of press you were to talk about. Definitely did not wish to turn up. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not him um, to do so, very much so. And in fact, here at the BFI, actually, when the DVD came out, uh, I remember it was very difficult to, to get him here. I was here too, but he wasn't very keen on his wife to turn. He's not a social person. Um, he was happy. Right. And that's, but he doesn't say it like that. Hmm, it's not far from what I thought. <laughs> it's not that far. I know you had problems. I know you had problems. I mean, he wouldn't say, wow, <laughs> that is not him, it's like that. But it's not too far from it. It's, it's very good for him to so say that. So that was much. possibly the most positive I think he the, would ever say. I think from people who knew him long before than myself, uh, who work actually on Creative as he said, that's very good for him because he is really not happy with anything because he really, his mind is there where the original idea came from and he imagined everything different. Yeah. And of course to think about, if you're being serious about, and you asked earlier and I did not really complete the answer, what is Stone Tape about? To try to get on the screen and make it effective that is the stone, the texture of a stone which reproduces an effect which is recorded centuries and centuries ago through that texture and it's activated. And out of that, both in sound and a vision, for certain people at certain time, in various strengths, you have an effect which could create 
extraordinary effect which would lead to suicide. Uh, it is very difficult to put on the screen in 1972 through television. Budgetary terms and facilities available. I mean, for us to have colored effects on a corridor meeting Jane Escher, who's trying to run away, and she is meeting different colored transparent objects coming and pushing her back. Now, how do you do that actually without post-production? Mm -hmm. Don't forget, there is no visual post-production in the stone tape or sound post-production. Because what the BBC Radiophonic Workshop produced, instead of music, because by the way, there is no music in the stone tape. What you hear is music, 90 minutes, produced by the Radiophonic Workshop. It's all electronic. Right. It's all, there is a, it used to be a wonderful place in Maidaville, um, which is called the Radiophonic Workshop. And the manager, uh, manager of that workshop worked very close with me um, before we got to the studio. So I spent a lot of time at Maidaville with him and his staff, terrific young, boys and girls there who really loved that. And we created sound music before, but it's not, you not dub it. There's no dubbing involved in the sound tape. You played in live again on those 20 minutes chunks or whatever. Right. Wow. This is what now today's generation of directors, producers will not actually comprehend it, A, because they were not born then, but B, they were not trained for it to understand it that you all prepared and all those things came with you in suitcases when you go to the studio or you go to location. You bring your effects. There's nowhere else to do it later on because there's no such thing. Because it's a videotape. Yeah. It's not film. You can't go to Ealing, which used to be a BBC at the time, and you do a post-production as a film in a dubbing theater. You are dealing with videotape. And in the early days, you hardly had a chance to edit a tape. I belong to the generation who actually were told you cannot cut a videotape. And then came the big deal when a guy came over the United States and all the directors, Moran, Philip Seville, a lot of we all called in and we had to very quiet in case we upset the tape. And that guy put on white gloves and we were all standing around those two inches large tapes, Winton, and he pulled it out and he sh with an ordinary gillette, little gillette, he cut one bit. Then he took a silver paper, <gasps> to make it hot, and he put a silver over it, rubbed it in, and he did an edit, where we cut the chunk out. And we applauded him because it played. It was that was the first video tape, two inches tape, was actually cut, edited, put together. We took a chunk out, and this guy called Trevor came from LA, put it together. Wow! And we thought it's amazing, absolutely amazing. And then slowly we were given permission. We can do three edits per sixty minutes. That was first, because it cost money. Then it's so it's it's a different world. Yeah. So when I said we had radio for it, we arrived with the tapes. We had to cue it in at the time when I wanted to use it. So I you said got cue music, music meaning that there yeah. at the moment. So that twenty minute chunk was everything. That's it. When I finished with it. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So that's why this is the only production out of whatever many I did. We're talking about hundred plus well. I did not complete my three days I was allocated in studio time for this production. And I overrun, which is the only production in my whole life here, which is well over 130 films I made here. How much did you overrun by? Well, I did not finish. And then the following week, the week beginning of the 4th of December, so quite late, I got an extra day. I could not do the corridor. That's how I remember that damn corridor, actually. <laughs> uh, I could not do Jane running with the... Because those 
things did not work. Yeah. It was so difficult to do it. They just wouldn't come up at the right uh, contrast with the various colors. Live with Jane being actually running on live camera, they are played back from another source right. video from the visual effects boys and the music to go with it. It just didn't work. Had to come back for one other morning to redo it. You were talking about budget earlier. Do you remember what the budget was for no it? No idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. Um, you also mentioned that you filmed in Surrey. Do you remember where else you filmed at all? Oh, for this one? No, that's one with just East Horsley. That's that all. It. That's it. The only place we went, and this is not filmed. Right. It's an outside broadcast unit. The day before they did a football match, and when they finished with me, next day we were doing, um, I think they went to horse racing. That's right. They went, I was scheduled between a football match and some horse racing. Right. Because they were not drama outside broadcast. They go, guys had no idea what is They drama. just did anything. Oh, yes. Outside broadcast. So you wanted to be very patient with them. So I, had to, I was told long before, now don't get ideas, don't tell them what is a, you know, medium close-up and all that, because they think it's the horse's hoof or something <laughs> like that, you know. Just <laughs> gently explain what you want. Because it's outside broadcast. Yeah. Because it's a video production. I could have, uh, that could be my stubbornness, uh, I could have asked for an Ealing film unit, 16 mil, and then it's very experienced, drama because you know Kathy can come home and all that they done it can do 16 mil film but with Chris Moore and day one we worked it out that let's try to do a video production of it because we both dislike the quality difference when you cut from video to film video film video film it will never match yeah it will look like it's something one is Mr. Smith, Mr. Brown, it not never be the same. And I got in and I agreed, I will do a 100% picture sound video. And that's what I've done. So I didn't mix it, which right. means I got an outside broadcast unit <laughs> <laughs> from a football match. <laughs> but I've done it. But the trouble is that it took that much longer. Wow. Uh, but it is the 90, whatever you see and hear, it's video. Right. And for a major drama, with full of special effects, vision and sound, it was very difficult to do. So uh, I am lighthearted now looking back and joking. I was very, very involved, totally drained out by the end of it. I yeah. mean, we were just made it for Christmas Day. I mean, the 4th of December, I was still shooting, you know, and all that had to go through. Then to final finish, uh, show to everybody, six floor, six floor and the buses, the old television center, which just closed now a few weeks ago, which is very sad. Because I was there on the opening television series, the one, the Asim of Games of Steel. Right. So it was very sad for me when it's closed down. Now. But anyway, so it was very much I wanted to do well. I was upset that I went over the only time in my whole television it career. It still haunts here. you, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, it's there. Yeah. You just don't want it. It's a ghost. <laughs> it's, it's my ghost in the stone tape. It's haunting me. It's terrible. You terrible. talked about it um, being shown on Christmas Day. It was the first BBC ghost story to be shown on Christmas Day. Yes. And originally it was meant to be part of the Dead of Night series. Yes, but it... Would. They yeah they put it onto yeah. Christmas Day. Were you surprised about how popular those shows were? I was quite pleased Christmas. actually because I appreciate with the trouble I caused with them the extra <laughs> lot that the powers above me they decided that it's rather good and they don't make it as a one-off something. So they very quickly after I finished on that week they changed it so it's enough for the. Radio Times to come out, yeah. which is usually Christmas before double edition. It, it's on there, so just in time. So it was the full publicity for it. It's a one-off, especially for Christmas Day. So it lost the umbrella, yeah, part of something. So yes, it slightly compensated me because I was quite pleased about that. <laughs> uh, yes, it was very popular. It was extremely well received. It had good press, um, and if I may say that. Honestly, 
after after 40 years, it became a bit of a cult. Yeah. Because I do go, because mainly the Hammer films and so on, some various festivals for the last few decades, and people in the audience, they, or conventions, they said, oh, do you mind if I ask a question about the stone tape? And very often, you know, people in the chair or moderating, they don't even know what might be, but very often questions coming up about the stone tape. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting how stone tape, among all the television credits I had, is one, because it almost belongs to my other, the film side of yeah. my profile. And I'm very pleased about that. It's really <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You're very welcome.